Well, yeah. Thank you for the lovely intro, Sean Sean. You forgot to mention that we were originally office mates back in grad school. Once upon a time. Well, it is definitely a pleasure to be here. Um, but before I get going, I, I should start off with a disclaimer or perhaps a confession or two, uh, which would be that this is actually a medical talk. Uh, I recognize this is a PL conference, but this is definitely a medical talk. But in fairness, and, and as a warning, I do do PL, um, or at least I did for a very long time. Uh, and in fact, if you look at what I did, as Shan Shan mentioned, I did, I think, mostly static analysis with little bits and parsing and relational programming and program synthesis towards the past couple of years. Uh, but even there, I'm a, a strange fit for Splash because uh, most of my papers have lambdas in them, uh, which makes them relatively non-applied. Um, and then, if you look at my actual training, um, yeah, I, up until, I guess, the past couple of years, I had actually no publications whatsoever in medicine. So all that is to say that, is that if anything in this talk resembles medical advice, and trust me, there's a lot in this talk that will resemble medical advice, um, for God's sake, do not take it, because um, uh, I'm the least qualified person to give it. And, and in fact, if you want to be really technical, I think my formal qualifications in medicine end with a C in sixth grade biology. Um, so with that in mind, let's, uh, let's get going. So uh, I also want to start off with an observation that this, this interplay between computer science and biology is by no means new, uh, that th this has happened before. In fact, if, if you look back, uh, there's a pretty famous biologist, Alan Turing. Um, so some of you may have, do you guys know who Alan Turing is? Yeah, yeah, well, I understand that some people outside of biology have, are aware of his, his contributions, um, but turns out that Alan Turing's number one paper by citations, according to Google Scholar, uh, is actually in biology. You know, so, so you know, biologists think of him as a biologist who maybe also did some stuff in computer science. Um, and, 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 and what he did is he actually uh, he, he found uh, that you could model how you go from a single cell to a complex organism using reaction diffusion systems. And I think the reason he was able to do this is that he thought very differently from other biologists. And I think computer scientists in general think very different from other biologists. So I often make a call uh, for, to computer scientists to say that it's not just time, in fact, it's long overdue for computer science to be integrated into biology and medicine. Really, it's time for computer scientists to be integrated into computer science, into, into biology and medicine, because the way we think actually gives us an advantage uh, in collaborations within the field. So uh, I'm going to make and hopefully support a number of claims today. And the first is that I think when we look back on this century, we're going to find that data was the greatest drug we, we discovered. Uh, I will argue that precision medicine is the way that you deliver data as a drug. And this means that precision medicine is really a process. Uh, it's, it's, as a field, it's really about developing a process for delivering data as a drug. And if it's a process, it means we need an algorithm. So it was, we will briefly define this algorithm uh, later on in the talk. Uh, and then I'm going to make a, a novel claim I don't typically make, but I've been sort of realizing lately in practice, which is that precision medicine needs proofs. Uh, and then the reason for that is that if you want to convince uh, a, a physician to do something, you need to give them a reason to do it. And, and proofs are actually a great vehicle for convincing people. So what is precision medicine? Uh, well, I, I, Obama uh, launched this precision medicine initiative about four years ago. And when he launched it, he gave it a definition. He said precision medicine, sometimes called personalized medicine, is really all about delivering the right drug to the right patient at the right time. Uh, now, as soon as he launched this initiative, a whole bunch of people tried to claim the mantle of precision medicine and offer their own definitions of precision medicine. Uh, and I spent you know, a good part of the last two years trying to clean up this sea of definitions that has emerged and come up with a unifying definition that entails all of these. And I think I've done that. So I think of precision medicine really as optimizing health of data. Uh, and, and some physicians will object to this. They'll say, well, I'm always trying to optimize my patient's health. So how can you say that this is something new? And what's really new is 
the sheer amount of data that you can collect on an individual patient, the kinds of data that you can collect on an individual patient, and therefore the necessity of using computation to actually do this optimization. So at a high level, you know, precision medicine looks something like this in practice. You, know, you start off, it's, it's, it really is a process that goes from a patient over to a, a pill or some treatment of some kind. And you start by extracting the patient's data. Uh, and the piece of data that got everybody very excited about precision medicine was the clinical accessibility of the human genome. The fact that you could get the source code to a human being was revolutionary as of about you know, seven or eight years ago. Uh, but I, I keep arguing that, that precision medicine goes well beyond just the use of the source code to people. Uh, it's, 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 in fact, it's, it's all the data that you can collect on a person. So if you can get access to their longitudinal EHR data, uh, if you can get access to their Apple Watch or Fitbit data, or even their social media data, all of that counts in the construction of this constrained optimization problem where you are modulating things like lifestyle and treatment to try to find the optimal health for that patient. And, and this is really why I think it's, it's also sort of subsume personalized medicine because we're trying to find this combination of treatment and lifestyle that produces optimal health for an individual patient using their own data to, con to construct this problem. So uh, just a disclaimer, in practice, we don't always have enough data to find the optimal treatment. Uh, in fact, this happens probably 85% of the time for a lot of the cases that I deal with right now. Uh, and instead of recommending a treatment, we'll recommend a scientific experiment that they should go do to illuminate the data we need to find the best possible treatment for them. Uh, and, and increasingly over time, we're finding sort of a standardized set of experiments that people need when they embark on these odysseys. Uh, and today, I'm going to add that it's really, you, you have to do more than just make a recommendation. Uh, that in practice, if you want to actually see a truly tailored, truly customized recommendation adopted by a physician for a patient, you also have to give them evidence, uh, a logical argument of sorts, that this is actually going to help that patient. Because you're, you're making a claim that whatever drug you've selected, which may not in any way resemble what it was intended for, is going to help a specific patient. And for that, they need an argument. So uh, what does this look like in practice? Uh, and I, to, to illustrate this, I'm actually going to tell you about my personal journey, about how I wandered from PL ultimately into medicine. And I'll, I'll use this to illustrate uh, the execution of this algorithm for precision medicine, and then generalize it and talk about its application in some other cases and the kinds of work that we're doing for, for patients today. So for me, the journey begins 11 years ago with my son Bertrand. So this is him when he's a year and a half old. Um, uh, he's 11 now, but you know, this, this for us was the start of a diagnostic odyssey uh, that would end ultimately with us being told that he was the first patient ever discovered for a brand new genetic disorder. Um, but back then, you know, when we didn't know what was happening, we lived in a place called Undiagnosed Island. And if you talk to parents uh, that have had a child go on this long diagnostic odyssey where there seems to be something wrong and they can't figure it out, this term will pop up. And it's, it's an island with a population of one patient or really one family. And when you're there, you don't know why your child is suffering. And, and for us, you know, when, when we were stuck there, we had no idea why Bertrand was having seizures, you know, why he had a complex movement disorder, why he had extreme developmental delay, and why for some reason he could not cry tears. Uh, so he could cry, he went through all the emotions of happiness and sadness, but yeah, he could never actually make liquid tears, which is leading to a number of problems uh, for his eyes. So uh, for 48 months, four years, that was, that was my life with, with Bertrand, was trying to figure out what this thing was. And, and at, at this point, honestly, by a year and a half, and I realized that there was some kind of bug in Bertrand's code. Most people agree this looked like a genetic disease of some kind. And the question was, where is the bug? You know, where is this, this you know, typo in the source code? So now I'll give you a little bit of biology 101 to talk about you know, how we actually go about doing things like precision medicine. So I knew you know, early on, again, about a year and a half in, that we had to look in Bertrand's genome to find the answer to this. But what does that really even entail? Well, you can think of you know, the, the human the genome. It's, 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 it's pretty big, actually. It's 6.5 billion characters. And in, in most genetic diseases, you know that there's really just one or two mutations driving the entire disease. And so the question is, how do you spot these typos uh, among 6.5 billion characters? And to put the problem in perspective, if you think about a 4K TV times 800, it's like spotting two broken pixels among them. That's, that's, the, that's what you're up against when you're trying to isolate the mutations driving genetic disease. Um, so it's, it's a challenge, but that's what we set out to do. So, but, you know, again, let's, let's just take this back to computer science. DNA is a string. It's a char star. Uh, it's got four letters in it, A, T, C, and G. 
And yeah, these letters um, you know, ultimately you know, string together in these you know, complex oligonucleotides we call DNA. Um, and, and the way this actually, the semantics of the system are, if you will, that DNA, a, a subset there, a substring thereof, a gene, turns into RNA, um, and it literally gets um, you know, tra transcribed into, or tra really transliterated into this. It's almost the same alphabet. Uh, and then the RNA breaks down into these three-letter sequences, where each three-letter sequence represents an amino acid. These get converted into amino acids, and then these amino acids chain together and ultimately fold, based on the prop electrochemical properties of their side chains, into a protein. Uh, and sometimes you have these post-translational modifications that happen afterwards, but that is basically the central biology of a uh, central dogma of biology in a nutshell. You go from DNA to RNA to protein, and proteins do all the interesting work. Um, so it turns out the genome actually has a syntax. Uh, in fact, it has a very clear instruction set. It's these three-letter codons. So if you see a sequence of DNA like this, it actually has an interpretation as a program. Um, and and uh, because each of these actually means something. So ATG, for example, really means begin the begin the program and insert into this chain a methionine. So that's that's a, every every gene begins with a methionine. Uh, and then if you see GCC, it is it does not mean compile C code in this case. Uh, <laughs> It, it, it actually means insert an alanine. And then there's an, uh, another sequence, TGA, which means stop, or you're done with the construction of the protein. So a sequence like this is actually a little program. It's begin the construction of the protein, insert a methionine, insert an alanine, done. That's, that's what it is. So a mutation is an alteration of the program. So if we take this program and we change out a letter, this is called a single nucleotide polymorphism, so we change a C into an A, we get not surprisingly, a different program. So instead of inserting an alanine now, you insert an aspartate. And you know, the, the challenge here is that you know, many mutations are, are, are benign. And if you, you know, look at the difference between the average two people, we could have up to 20 million different mutations between us. Um, most of them obviously aren't going to hurt us. Some will do. So some will. Some will actually destroy function. And some will increase function in some way. And some will change function. Um, but you know, spotting which of even the 20 million could actually be problematic is, is a real challenge. Um, so to actually do this, I ended up partnering with scientists at Duke University at the time. This is about seven or eight years ago now. And we did uh, trio exome sequencing on Bertrand. He's actually one of the first human beings ever to have his exome sequenced. And your exome is the 2% of your genome that encodes proteins. So it's, it's really economical to focus on just the exome. Uh, and it, it really drops the cost of doing this by an order of magnitude, which made it ultimately clinically accessible at the time. And what we found is that Bertrand actually had two pretty glaring errors in his genome a gene called NGLI1. He actually had two syntax errors. Not, not even just like semantic errors, but literal syntax errors in the code. So in one case, a letter had been deleted, which shifted all the letters over by one, which of course scrambles all the letters behind it, or all the, all the codons behind it. And the other one, a, a stop instruction was literally dropped into the middle of the gene through, through a mutation. So what was used to be an amino acid turned into a stop. So you get a fragment of a protein which is non-functional. So we got lucky in the sense that, you know, at the, at the time it was actually difficult to figure out you know, what mutations were harmful, but this was so glaring, it meant very clearly that this gene was destroyed. There was no chance of this gene being around. There was uh, absolutely no protein, protein even being produced for the gene. So, um, yeah, and, and, and then you know, the, the researchers at the time said, well, we think this is the cause of his disease, but if this is it, he is literally the first patient anyone has ever seen with this disease. Uh, the only one we know of, so he's really an N of one. Uh, and then the question is, well, how do you even know that this is really it. I mean, we were pretty we were pretty convinced this was it, but you end up doing this process called variant interpretation. Um, and, and the way it works is you take all the data points you have on a patient, all their medical records and lab values, whatever you can find on them, and you have to tie this logically back to the underlying purported mutations in the genome. So to do this, you actually have to understand every single time what that particular gene does. Now in this case, NGLI1 is, is a gene that encodes an enzyme. Uh, and that enzyme is responsible for deglycosylating misfolded glycoproteins after they've been retrotranslocated from the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol, which to me seven years ago meant as much to all of you right now, um, which is to say nothing. Um, but over time, I figured out what this meant. And, and what it really means is that this, this is a recycling enzyme. It recycles a particular kind of waste in the cell called a misfolded glycoprotein. And what it does is it rips the sugars off uh, so that they can actually, so some proteins have sugars attached. And you, if you want to recycle them, you have to tear the sugars off first. So the, the thing that tears the sugar off is missing. And as a result, you get these things piling up inside the cell. 
Uh, and so we were, we were reasonably certain at that point, based on some evidence that these things actually were accumulating in his liver, that this really was what was driving the disease. And then, of course, you know, the physicians, as they do, were like, yeah, and unfortunately, this is not actionable. Um, and this, this is, a, this is a, a standard term in medicine where they say there's just nothing you can do. Uh, and they're like, well, look, no one's even heard this disease before. We can't even give you a prognosis, so just take your child, take your child home and, and make him comfortable. That was, that was basically what they said when he was four years old. And I just fundamentally disagreed with that. And I would hope anybody in this room or any, any scientist would disagree with that because I, I believe that all information is actionable. Um, once you know the root cause of a disease, you should be able to do something about it. So uh, I, I always contend that you can, you can do science in the event of the not actionable. And that in precision medicine, oftentimes it's science that becomes medicine. And so when I talk about you know, sometimes recommending an experiment to a patient, this is what I mean. You know, that sometimes we don't have a pill to give them, but we could always recommend some kind of experiment that will get us one step closer to the pill that they need to take. Uh, so that was, you know, four years of my life, um, you know, getting to the point where we realized Bertram was the first patient ever discovered with this disease. Uh, and then things kind of took off. Yeah, so I, I jumped into the basic science behind this gene, which meant I learned a lot of glycobiology. Uh, but I also realized right away that you can't have one patient or one family versus an entire disease. That doesn't work. You've got to do something about this. So uh, I said, if you look at, you, you can look at these databases at the frequency of the, the disease causing alleles. And I estimated, you know, it's, it's not hard to say that, well, it's a rare disease, sure. But there should be somewhere on the order of, you know, 500 patients out there that have this disease. Uh, across the world. So it's a one in millions kind of thing, but they should be out there. And they just don't know what they have because this, dis this disease hadn't been documented yet. Uh, so to find them, what I did is I wrote a blog post. And this blog post really had to do two things. It had to go viral and it had to rank highly in Google search results. So this is the blog post that I wrote. Um, so the picture of Liam Neeson, the clickbaity title, uh, all that stuff, you know, that's to get it to go viral. Uh, and you know, honestly, I probably could have swapped in a cat picture for Liam Neeson and it would have worked just as well because the internet is more or less sadly predictable like that. Uh, and the thing is, it actually worked. It really did go viral and it really did start to rank highly in Google search results. And so literally within two weeks, it actually it found matching patients for this disease across the world in Turkey. There was a sibling pair that were undiagnosed, presenting similarly, that were genetically confirmed to have the exact same disease. And you know. Uh, seven years later, I think we have on the order of 70 patients connected together worldwide for, for understanding, treating, and curing this disease. And this led to some other stuff. So it led to an article in The New Yorker. Uh, it also led to me going around the world in some cases. You know, whenever I you travel, I'll, I'll try to meet patients uh, nearby. So I ended up meeting some patients in Germany uh, that, uh, that, that have this disease. Uh, the article in The New Yorker led to me getting invited to uh, participate in this uh, big NIH effort called the Undiagnosed Diseases uh, Network. Uh, finding patients led the NIH to take an interest in the science of this disease and the, and the establishment of a clinical trial where all these patients would come and enroll in what's called a natural history study where they would donate a week of their time uh, and a lot of bodily fluids at one week every year indefinitely to understand the basic science of this disease. Um, and my involvement in the UDN ultimately led to an invitation to join the faculty at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, the uh, basic science combined with the natural history study data then allowed me to start making predictions about what might be therapeutic for this disease. And in fact, two years after the discovery of the disease, I made my first prediction um, or first discovery of a therapy for the disorder. I'm going to come back to this in a bit and how I found it, but for now I just want to keep going. Because um, I, I did this by hand at the time, and I think that there are you know, PL based principles for how we could generalize the process by which I found that treatment. Uh, I ended up you know, co-founding a company not long after this that focused on doing uh, identification of uh, existing drugs that work for rare uh, uh, ultra rare ion channel based epilepsies. Uh, in fact, we were so successful at helping patients that after two and a half years, we were acquired by Key State Biosciences, who can do this in a much more interesting way. Uh, and then I uh, ended up uh, having enough preliminary data to actually pick up a grant to, to do therapeutics development for NGLI1 deficiency in partnership with folks in the College of Pharmacy back at the University of Utah where I was. So, in a nutshell, what we did with this grant was we gave planarian worms this disease. Uh, planarian worms are fantastic for, as a model of development because if you cut them in half, they actually completely regrow. Um, so we said, we want to study the developmental aspects of this disease. We want to see if we can rescue this part of, of, the, of the, the disorder. And, and so um, many dead worms later, uh, we ended up discovering that there's an, another gene that interacts with NGLI1 called N-gaze, which is actually a drug target for this disorder. Uh, so if you inhibit N-gaze, you can actually correct the developmental aspects of the disorder in worms. 
So that meant, you know, can we find a drug that actually targets and inhibits this particular enzyme? So to do that, this became a computational problem. It's a, it's a simulation. So we actually uh, built a 3D structure for this target molecule, N-gaze, and then we simulated 200,000 different small molecules interacting with that structure to see if there was anything out there that was inverse and shape and charge to the active site on, on N-gaze. Uh, so it, the logic being that if it was, that it could stick to it and it could stop it. You know, we were looking for a way to inhibit this particular process. So of the 200,000 small molecules that we simulated, 70 ended up uh, looking like they were true inhibitors according to the, the, the simulation. 14 were already FDA approved. And when we took those 14 to the lab and actually tested them you know, biochemically, one actually worked. And, and that one just so happens to be Prevacid. So Prevacid is a proton pump inhibitor meant for acid reflux. However, all this time it's had a hidden side effect. Prevacid is also an N-gaze inhibitor, uh, and it happens to be therapeutic for, for Bertrand's disease. And, and this highlights a key feature of precision medicine, which is that we almost always take or recommend drugs not for their original purpose, but based on some side effect, which may have been hidden up to that point. Uh, that, that's something that happens a lot. Uh, and then things got really weird for me. So uh, I was actually you know, give, giving a lecture uh, in, in, at a med school, and I got an email saying, um, you know, was, this is a Tuesday afternoon. I was in California. They said, could you be to the White House by Friday? I thought, I guess so. Uh, uh, so I showed up. Uh, and then the night as I was flying in, it got extra weird. They said, OK, so just let yourself in the White House at 930. Um, and uh, go ahead and you know, wander around. Find the portrait of JFK. And at 1030, someone will, will come get you. I thought, OK, well, I haven't been in the White House. I don't know where that portrait is. But I'm sure if I wander around enough, I can find it. Um, and the irony here is actually I was born in DC, but I'd never seen the White House till, till this day. So this is me walking up to the White House. Uh, at this point, they said I had to stop taking photos, so I hid it in my pocket um, <laughs> and kept taking photos. <laughs> uh, once I got upstairs, I, I, could, I could take photos again and um, just sort of wandered around the first floor. Eventually found, uh, this is a library downstairs. Um, it's got nice books and swords and china. Uh, <laughs> eventually found the portrait of JFK, and this, this woman came out and said, uh, right this way, and led me into this bright red room. Uh, in fact, there's this whole suite of state rooms, and I was just sort of free to wander in here for an hour. So I did. I just sort of took a look at everything that I could find. Um, <laughs> and then uh, one of the guards is like, hey, you know, you can, you can sit down if you want. You can use the furniture. Uh, I was like, well, if you insist, uh, <laughs> I will use the furniture. I'm going to sit on everything in this room. Um, <laughs> so that's what I did uh, for about an hour. <laughs> uh, and then they're like, all right, yeah, give us your cell phone. Um, but <laughs> but uh, I honestly didn't, wasn't upset because uh, then this guy walked in. And he's like, all right. So I want to launch this precision medicine initiative. Uh, I want to scale up the kinds of things that you've done for your son, but ultimately for the entire country. And I was wondering if you would be willing to help out on this. And I was like, yes, yes, I, I, I will do that. Um, whatever you want. So uh, th that for me was the start of a, a sort of a three-year odyssey with the White House. Um, and uh, it ultimately culminated in the launch of the Precision Medicine Initiative. I ended up you know, writing some of the, the founding white papers for this. Um, and, and what this is really doing, what it, what it turned into, is what's called now the, the All of Us Initiative, or the All of Us Program. And it's collecting a million genomes and the corresponding medical records for, for Americans. And, and the goal here is really, the way I describe it, is to build the Rosetta Stone of the human genome. Because right now, I could sequence anybody in this room. And I could find lots of mutations. What I can't do is tell you if they actually mean anything in terms of your health. Um, but if we had a million people, we had their genomes, and we had their medical records, we could index in for any mutation and say, well, what does this do in aggregate to human health? Um, and it, you know, I think for a lot of the more common mutations, we'll have enough data to do this. Um, I predict, actually, we'll probably need closer to 10 million people over time if we want to make this work for the, the ultra-rare variants. But a million is a good start. And this program is now well underway, and I think it's probably enrolled to close to 100,000 people. Um, I did a lot of work on the Million Veterans Program. Uh, which is a sister program to that that had already enrolled of 500,000. I launched a small initiative within the Precision Medicine Initiative called uh, PETMA. And, and PETMA was it's called the Patient Empowered Precision Medicine Alliance. And the whole goal here was really to just repeat as a proof of principle that yeah, every, everything I just done with Bertrand, but for other disorders now. So we wanted to do this within 12 months. Uh, and the reason it was 12 months is that was, that was at that point all the time Obama had left in office. Um, and so I'll give you an example of the kinds of things that happened under, under PETMA. So, 
uh, you know, uh, we did this for a variety of ways. Some of it was very bench science, some of it was very computational. But in one of the computational cases, we had a newly discovered disorder called its haploinsufficiency in USP7, meaning they were missing one of their copies of USP7. And this is actually essentially the first patient discovered with this disease. Um, and, and it turns out that there's, there's, a, there's a company out there that I was collaborating with at the time that could model this disease in cells. And the way they do it is, is they have lots of high resolution imaging, uh, computer vision algorithms, a bunch of machine learning, and they, they look at a cell, like a healthy cell, and then they give it a genetic disease. And they, they look at how the morphology of the cell changes as a function of introducing the disease. And then they ask a pretty simple question. If we just give lots of drugs to these cells, is there anything out there that makes it look like it used to? That's the idea behind uh, uh, this approach to finding drugs. So you, you can just test all approved drugs this way. Uh, and that, that's what companies like Recursion can do. Uh, and in fact, they actually did identify two drugs in clinical trials, these heat shock protein inhibitors that did rescue the morphology of the disease cells in USP7. So, and we did that for about four or five other diseases. And so by the time Obama was leaving office, I could go back for my, my final report. This, this wasn't it. The final report was actually uh, in, in the situation room. I could say, look, you know, I, I think, you know, this vision of precision medicine, um, of, of what you envision for how it would work, it's real. You know, we have enough examples now to show that we can repeat this process uh, and hopefully someday scale it up. So, um, you know, then there was an election, uh, you, you may recall. Uh, and oddly enough, um, they were so, so short-staffed, they actually asked me to stick around. So I stayed for a year in the Trump White House. Uh, and uh, boy, that was a fun year. Uh, so I think I, after a year, I'd done sort of all the good I think I could reasonably do. And so I went ahead and quit. Um, and people will ask me, you know, uh, what was it like working for a year in the Trump administration? I think all I can legally say at this point is that it was interesting um, <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, gather, I gather from recent news reports that this is still pretty much true. Um, so then I got a pretty remarkable offer um, from, from UAB. Uh, they said, we're going to build this institute from scratch for precision medicine. Uh, would you like to come be its founding director? You know, and, and really implement your vision for precision medicine. I thought, yeah, I, I would love to do that. And, and so it's, it's, it was in this, it's an institute. It could hire faculty. could really execute on a grand vision for how to scale this whole process up. And so that's what I started to do. Um, so the question is, how do you scale this up? How do you scale up precision medicine so that it's not just Bertrand and it's not just a one-off here and there, but how do you do this repeatedly for lots of people? So. The, the core idea, again, is drug repurposing. You want to use the existing arsenal of approved drugs, but in novel ways. So that and it could be an individual drug, it could be a combination of drugs, but you want to, in some way, you know, use these almost to sort of program the cells to get them to do what you want to correct the disease. So uh, one way to do this, and I'll talk about three ways in total, is to do physical drug screens. And, and by this, I mean, you, t you start off with a patient, and from them, you extract some kind of disease model. And this could be a cellular model, it could be an animal model, it could be, uh, you know, uh, a, in some cases a computational model, but you need a model that represents the disease in some way. Um, and it could be patient-derived, it could be, literally come from patient tissue, or it could be where you get a genetics report and you put that mutation in a different cell line. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's, as long as you can actually observe that model and see a signature of the disease, then yeah, you're good to go for screening. So then the whole point is to start combining that model with different drugs. And there's, if you take all the approved drugs around the world, there's about two to 3,000, depending on how you count. Uh, and you want to try all of them and just see if anything out there actually produces what's called a rescue in the model. And if it does, then hopefully that will, will scale up to the patient. In practice, you know, there, there might be other things you have to do once you find that, find that drug, because maybe you can't give it at the right concentration, or maybe you need an extended release form. Maybe you have to tweak the molecule a little bit. Um, that stuff will happen. I'm not going to cover that in this talk, but that's the kind of thing that can happen when you engage in this work. Uh, but one example of this was, again, a, a, a two PETMA patients where we did this for a sodium channel-driven epilepsy called SCN8A. SCN8 is the name of the gene. These kids had overactivity in the gene, so we were looking for inhibitors. So what we did is we literally we took their mutations, we put them into kidney cells, because kidney cells are really good growers, and we grew them up across these grids where we could measure their electrophysiological properties. And, and we could actually measure sort of the root cause of seizure-like activity in these, kidney, in these genetically modified kidney cells. And check to see if anything actually corrected that activity. So we did that, and actually for both of these patients, found existing approved drugs that reduced their seizures. In one case, it was a 
uh, an unusual anti-epileptic, carbamazepine. In another case, it was actually a headache medication, uh, also sometimes used as an antidepressant or amitriptyline. And so that, that ended up working uh, for the other patient's seizures. So you know, sometimes you find sort of a, a drug indicated for the disorder, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you find, again, headache medication or an antidepressant that happens to work for an epilepsy. Uh, I won't go into any more detail about this. If you want to um, you know, go into detail on it, I've, I've published this last year. It talks about how we did the screens, how we found the drugs, um, and, and, and reason about what to do with them. Uh, and now just, just to show you how far biology has come, I will show you sort of the next generation of this. And so, so the company that bought my company has a totally novel way of doing electrophysiology in neurons uh, in, in, in such a way that we have unprecedented resolution on neurological disease within the brain. So uh, what they do, and this just blows me away that this is even possible, is they add two genes to neurons. So they can, they can literally, well, they can start with patient skin. They can go patient skin to stem cells, stem cells to neuron. And in the process, having added in these two genes, one is sensitive to blue light. So it will activate when hit by blue light. The other one emits red light once it's been activated. And so you can actually stimulate uh, neurons in a dish arbitrarily and then watch the signal propagate with extraordinary resolution between neighboring neurons. And so what you're watching here is the firing of an individual neuron. You know, with you know, measurements according to the color of the pixel, the intensity of the signal as it propagates. And so when you do this, you can get very high resolution uh, you know, signatures of many neurological diseases. So this, this, is, this is a very powerful technique. Uh, and it's, it's many orders of magnitude more efficient in terms of the number of, uh, in fact, it's, it's like t you know, 10 orders of magnitude more efficient in terms of the number of neurons you can measure a day uh, for uh, uh, you know, electrophysiology uh, using this approach. And so this is now being used to develop new drugs, but also to t develop therapies for individual patients. Um, because you, you can drug screen against this model too. You know, these movies generate about 200 different features that can be used to you know, create effectively the signature for the disorder. Now, the second way, and I think the one more interesting and relevant to this crowd, is to use logic programming. So um, in, in this, you know, the bulk of the work is actually being done by Will Bird. Uh, so he's, he's faculty at, at UAB in my institute, worked with him for many years on relational programming and things like mini uh, and, and we've now started to take you know, mini Canron and pour into it essentially all the biomedical knowledge we can get our hands on uh, from, from every data set that we, we, we can reasonably find. Um, so many kind of, if you haven't used it before, it's a, it's a logical programming language. It's specifically a relational programming language because it doesn't allow side effects. Um, and, and previously we were using it for things like program synthesis, and now we're using it to do drug repurposing. So now I'll show you how we do that. But in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is take old school logic combined with high speed automated reasoning to achieve superhuman like deduction with clinical insight. Um, so this, this, this is more or less the goal. Some people call this this artificial intelligence, and back in the 1980s, I think it was fair to call it exactly that. You know, this this really was what AI was back then. So you can ask the system very low-level questions, like you can say at a molecular level, what is an inhibitor for for gene X, and it can go off and try to find these uh, directly or indirectly, or you can ask it very high-level questions, like what might be a treatment for some disease X, and it, it will go off and hypothesize. So for example, if you ask it about overactive bladder, it will say, well, there's 145 potential treatments for overactive bladder uh, that, that it, it can think of, which is actually much more than most urologists can come up with. Um, so yeah, it, it really has deep insight at this point. Uh, or you can give it a condition that has no, no known treatments and say, can you come up with potential treatments for this? So Fanconi's anemia is actually an example of where this happened. So actually, the, the way we got funding for this tool was uh, th through NIH was uh, through a, essentially this, this, weird, this bizarre process, like NIH decided that they were jealous of DARPA and said, well, we want, we want to do DARPA-like things. So they came up with a contest. And, and to even access the funding announcement, you had to solve one bioinformatics challenge per page. So you unlocked one page of the PDF at a time. Um, that led you to a point where you, you could submit a proposal. Um, you then had to do a remote, remote demo within a month of your proof of concept, and then an on-site demo two months later, um, where they sort of unveiled Iron Chef style this disease to go after. So we did that for Fanconi's anemia and generated about 10 suggestions for how to treat this disease uh, using our prototype tool. And it came up with, I think the most interesting one was xylitol. So xylitol is the stuff that you find in chewing gum. Um, and so it's, it's, this, this definitely shocked the, the, the Fanconi's anemia experts in the room, but there's a logic to it. And the logic is that xylitol 
inhibits alcohol dehydrogenase. Alcohol dehydrogenase creates reactive aldehydes. Reactive aldehydes create double-stranded breaks in DNA, which Fanconi's anemia patients cannot repair. So that was the full path of reasoning to why it recommended xylitol, and in fact, a number of other drugs for this disorder. So that you know, impressed them enough. They said, OK, we will fund this tool. Uh, so we've been funded under NIH for about the, the past year and a half. So um, yeah, we actually tricked NIH into funding PL research. It's kind of amazing. Um, so how do we do this? Well, you know, it's a lot of natural language processing. So uh, it's, it's read all of PubMed. There's only 30 million papers. Uh, but every abstract has been condensed into a series of propositions now. So uh, and it, it really to create this knowledge graph. For the nodes in the graph are things like genes and drugs and symptoms. And you have these relationships between them. So for example, there's now a node in this knowledge graph from our paper that says Prevacid inhibits N-gaze. And uh, if you look at the broader network, you can query it, not just for paths that happen to be connected to each other, because everything in bi biology is connected to everything else. This was a problem they faced when they tried to find meaningful paths between two points in biology. But you can say, show me the logically connected paths, according to some rules of inference between two points, so there's a biological significance between the two concepts. So these are some of the core relationships that it knows about, like you know what inhibits what, how a disease manifests with symptoms, whether or not a gene or drug can increase the expression of another gene. Um, so these, these, again, these are the core properties. And from this, you can build synthetic relationships, like may treat. So you can say, you know, this drug may treat this disease if this gene, there's a gene that causes this disease, and this disease increases the activity of this gene, and there's some drug out there that decreases the activity of that gene. So that's a you know, very, very simplified example of a kind of you know, uh, complex proposition you can construct from the basic ones. And of course, if you want, you can express these as inference rules, the kinds that might show up in some of the papers that, that people in this community would write. Um, and you know, there, there turns out to be one that we one recursive inference rule that is tremendously useful, really a pair of inference rules that are very useful. And that's to say that if you know that blue increases red uh, and that red decreases green, you can infer that blue, by increasing a decreaser, should also decrease green. And this is important because a lot of times we can't hit a target directly. We'll have to pass through some, inter some intermediate biologically to get to it. So we can you know, phrase this as an inference rule, and we can add this to, to Medicandrin. And so now when we're querying for inhibitors, we don't just find the direct inhibitors. We can find indirect ones as well. In fact, we can go arbitrarily many links back if we want. In general, we don't want to go more than a hop or two back because the further you go back, and we, when you play that forward, the more other targets you start to hit, so the more the side effects will increase. Um, so why is it that proofs really matter in precision medicine? And this really comes from my experience in actually trying to do this for patients. Uh, and that's that physicians need proofs. If they're actually going to help a patient, uh, then you, you actually need to give them a reason to do that. So to do this, we've created a research consultation service uh, at, at UAB. And the goal here is to systematically find the next step for every patient in their therapeutic odyssey. So we follow a step-by-step -step process. And this is what I really call the algorithm for precision medicine. And, and the, the way it works is, uh, you know, uh, it's a process, again, for going from a patient to a pill. And, and it, it really is a step-by-step -step process where we figure out where they are in terms of their diagnostic or therapeutic odyssey. And I'm just going to show it to you in high speed right now and then zoom in on the, the core of it, which is what actually matters. Um, but we, we guide them along and figure out, you know, how to get from, from one stage to the next each time. Um, and and I mean, in reality, it really is like a, it's, it's, an, it's, it's actually an NFA because you know, there, there could be multiple next steps at any given point in time. Uh, so at the core of the algorithm is, is really this one sort of you know, choice point where we look at the core mechanism or mechanisms involved in the disease and we ask, is it um, overactive, is it underactive, and is, it, is it absent or is it toxic? And then we'll try to inhibit it, activate it, compensate for it, or eliminate it based on which direction we've gone. And we have a playbook behind each of these now. So we started this program about a year and a half ago. Uh, and, and since we launched it, we've seen and helped about a, you know, literally probably 300 patients at this point. So it's, it's, and, and we really try to take on only the patients that have failed absolutely everything else for which there is no other option available. Uh, and so the question we've been answering constantly is how do we scale this up? How do we make this something that we, we can do efficiently at scale? It turns out brilliant undergraduates are a core component of this. You know, so under, I use undergraduates for a couple reasons. One is that you know, they're everywhere. So they're, they're a ubiquitous resource. Um, and those that they're incredibly cheap. Um, and so you can, you can do a lot with undergrads. So this is the team we have right now. And actually, the guy on the lower right, he's an MD, PhD student. But everybody else either was an undergrad um, or is an undergrad currently, and uh, that works for the program. And what they do is they really coordinate. Uh, somebody called them the care traffic controller uh, between the physician, the scientists, the patients, and the, the computational tools that we've developed. And, and, and I'm arguing that a core part of their job is to actually render a human readable proof to the physician anytime a recommendation goes back. Um, 
So we also develop a lot of in-house software. So we have essentially our own customized e, uh, EMR, if you will, that can, that can speed up the review of the cases that we do once a week. We also have a lot of great faculty and staff. So I've hired about five faculty in just the past year to get this program off the ground. So I'll give you some examples now of the kinds of reasoning that these students go through uh, when they do this. So for example, May had a patient where they had a mutation in a gene called TMLHE. She reasoned that uh, it was actually causing a loss of function in this particular gene. This gene happened to be in the carnitine biosynthesis pathway, which means that downstream you ended up losing carnitine, uh, and that the fix for that would really just be supplemental carnitine. Jillian had a more complicated case. Um, you know, so she had a, a patient with a mutation, a gene called RoBTB2. Turns out the mutation was in a region of the gene responsible for its degradation. And so when you messed up that region of the gene, you actually ended up with too many copies of RoBTB2, hence a gain of function on the activity of this, of this gene. She couldn't find a direct uh, down regulator for, for RoBTB2, but she could go back you know, through Medicanron to the regulator of RoBTB2, E2F1, and say, Celecoxib down regulates that. So she could put together this argument that celecoxib could ultimately be therapeutic for this particular disease. And just to give you an example you know, this, of the kinds of proofs that we rendered, this is literally the, the report with the patient's name blocked out that we sent over to the physician. Uh, then Lindsay found a mutation in MAPK and IP3, which ended up being leading to what's called a haploinsufficiency in this particular gene. And that of all things, vitamin A, uh, is what upregulated the, the, this gene back to, to normal levels. Of course, you have to take very high levels of vitamin A, but um, in this case, this is a patient that was non-ambulatory. They weren't walking. Um, in fact, they couldn't even stand when they reached out. This is at five years old. Uh, but after six months of extremely high-dose vitamin A, uh, the mom sent us a video showing that her child was not just standing, but really beginning to take their first steps. Uh, and this is a disorder with about five patients around the world. And, and this significantly diverges from the expected natural history of the disease now, um, where you know, to have this child standing and walking. So uh, we're reasonably confident that, in fact, this is what's making the difference. And we're in the process of, of publishing this now as a, as a clinical report. Uh, and also doing some work with worms that have this disorder uh, to really show the effect there as well. Then another interesting case, and one that I like because it highlights the fact that we can take on non-genetic cases, was intractable cyclic vomiting. So this is a patient that reached out at 19 years old, uh, really her parents saying, you know, we've tried everything for our daughter. We just don't know what to do at this point because she's, you know, since 11, vomited multiple times a day. Uh, at this point, she only weighs 78 pounds despite being 5'4", and we're very worried for, for her survival now. So uh, the thing people always say when they reach out to us is, you know, of course, we've tried all known treatments. And, and the truth of the matter is that's almost never true. Uh, there's always something else you can try because there's 30 million papers out there. And uh, you know, if you look at, there's 64,000 on nausea, 4,000 on treating nausea, and between there's 374 distinct treatments for nausea. So they tried maybe the top dozen or two, now, and, and, uh, and, um, which, which is fair. But uh, if you um, rank, the num rank these treatments by the number of papers that support them, you'll find up at the top Zofran, sort of the, the, the number one anti-nausea drug that's out there right now. But if you, you know, keep going down this histogram, you enter a region called what we would call the unknown known, the region of the curve where you know, people have tried it, they've published it somewhere, uh, and they have some evidence that it actually works. So way down this curve, to when you get to just three papers in support, we found nasally inhaled isopropyl alcohol. So rubbing alcohol from the sink on a cotton pad and you sniff it. Uh, so there's three papers in support of this for nausea. And we sent this back to her as being sort of the safest next thing that she could quickly try. Um, our physicians recommended it. And, and literally within hours heard that she was able to start arresting episodes of vomiting uh, using this technique. Um, and in fact, ended up going um, the next eight months without vomiting uh, and got to 125 pounds as, as a result. And in fact, not just that, at eight months, uh, was so well that she was out of the hospital and in fact was able to marry her high school sweetheart and move to California. Um, so just an example of the kinds of things that can happen unexpectedly, because we didn't expect to be able to take on disorders like this, but as a side effect of mining out the literature, you know, when we were originally after genes, we found that we could create these histograms for standard and non-standard care. So if you're interested and you happen to be in Birmingham, Alabama on a Monday, uh, you're welcome to join us. We have, uh, our case review process is open. All patient identifying information is redacted, so there's no HIPAA violations. Um, and, and, and you can just sit in and watch. You can contribute if you want, uh, but, and we have uh, visitors come by all the time. And in fact, we, we've been so successful in the last year and a half that the, the health system at UAB has said, we want you to move this in as a clinical service so that any physician or any patient that's sort of run out of options knows where to reach and what to do. Um, 
So if you're wondering if we've made predictions for Bertrand using the software, well, we absolutely have. And in fact, uh, it came up with a pretty interesting suggestion, which was uh, broccoli. Um, much to Bertrand's chagrin, because uh, he does not like broccoli. In fact, it recommended specifically 60 pounds of broccoli per day. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's because he was trying to get one essential nutrient inside the broccoli, which is sulforaphane. Uh, luckily, you can buy condensed sulforaphane pills, so you can just take the pill instead. Um, but again, you know, there, there's an argument for, for why it did this. You know, it said that it thinks you know, sulforaphane may treat NGLI1 deficiency because NGLI1 deficiency deactivates something called NERF1. NERF2 can rescue NERF1, and sulforaphane can increase NERF2. So here's a little mini proof for why it thinks that sulforaphane would be a good thing to do uh, for Bertrand, and why I can tell Bertrand you have to eat your broccoli. Um, um, so another way that you might be able to do this um, is static analysis. Uh, and, and, and here the idea is that you can maybe compensate for the total loss of some enzymes by reasoning about the consequences of the missing enzymes. So uh, an enzyme is really, you can think of it as a function that turns A's into B's. So let's say you have some enzyme and in a disorder like NGLI1, that enzyme goes missing. So suddenly what you have is an overabundance of A's, potentially, or a deficiency in B's. Um, so the, the strategy here becomes, can you give B's or can you restrict the things that create A's? Uh, and there's examples of disorders where this works extremely well. So for PKU, if you restrict phenylalanine, it's effectively a cure. If you don't, it's a devastating disease. For MPICDG, if you give mannose, it's a manageable disorder. If you don't, it's a pretty devastating disease. And again, you're just correcting for the missing inputs or, or the, the toxic in, inputs or the missing outputs when you do this. Well, NGLI1 is an enzyme, and it has A's and B's that we really uh, you know, reason very carefully about through basic science over a couple years. And, and we uh, got a sense of exactly what, the, the, what was missing from, from NGLI1. In fact, uh, while I was at NIH uh, two years into this natural history study, I, I reasoned that based on the structure of the proteins that were aggregating, they were sequestering one metabolite in particular. And that metabolite happens to be represented here by this little blue square. It's called n uh, And it turns out if you Google this, you can literally buy it on the internet. In fact, you can buy it on Amazon.com. Uh, so I did that. I, I just bought this thing. So Bertrand's probably missing it. I can buy it on Amazon. I bought it. And then a bag shows up at my house two days later because it's Amazon Prime. And just literally sat there with a spoon and ate the entire bag. Um, and you know what? I didn't die. I'm here today. I'm alive. And that, for me, concluded FDA phase one safety testing. Uh, <laughs> uh, because you know, in my household, honestly, in every parent's household, the parent is the FDA. That's just how it works. And, uh, and then, then I said, hey, well, let's see what this can do for Bertrand. Uh, so gave it to Bertrand, and I didn't know what it was going to do, actually. I didn't know if it would help with seizures, if it would help with a movement disorder, you know, the developmental delay. Um, I had no idea what to expect. I didn't, and again, I might not have done anything at all. But three days into giving him this, I went and looked over, and I saw that he was actually crying tears for the first time in his life. Um, you know, and so yeah, I, I did what any parent would do in that situation when they see their child cry for the first time. I collected his tears. Uh, I packed them on dry ice. And I shipped him to a lab in California for analysis. <laughs> um, so we did proteomics on his first tears, um, you know, like most parents do. So yeah, those first tears really, you know, the, they were small tears for Bertrand, um, but he's cried many tears since. But they really became an ocean of science for the disorder as a whole. Uh, and, and other patients do seem to have the same effect when, when they try the supplement. Some don't sleep as well on it, uh, but most, I think, consider it worth doing. And that's because when you don't make tears, you know, your, your eyelids will start to erode your corneas, and you'll be blind by about age 10. Um, and so some of the older kids that we find have severe vision loss as a result of, of this disease. And Bertrand had already had eye surgeries to correct the, the, the pus in his eyes from, from these infections. I mean, it was, it was awful. In fact, to protect his remaining vision at this point, they, they were telling us that they needed to sh sew his eyes shut, um, which was just a procedure called a tarsigraphy, which is just, don't Google it, it's awful. Um, and and uh, because of this, you know, that's never going to be an issue for him. Yeah, his vision is fine today. So, you know, if I give this talk to a normal group of people, they just say, that's great. But if I give this talk to a group of biologists, they say, that's great that you can help people, but we're biologists, and we have a different question. We want to know, does it work in flies? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we built a fly model, and it turns out it's pretty lethal that if you give flies NGLI1 deficiency, that only about 17% will survive. Uh, but if you give them this compound, their survival rate shoots up to around 80 90%. 
So this is, again, strong evidence that we're really interfering with a, a big mechanism in this disease. So if, uh, I won't go into the details of this, but we did a lot of work on this to understand why that was so in this, uh, in this paper. Uh, and in general, if you want to predict A's and B's, you know, I think there's a, there's a way to do this using PL. So this, this is where the PL comes in, I think could actually have a big role someday. So Gene Yang came down to Birmingham at one point. We started collaborating on a project to use CAPA to model metabolic pathways. Um, and so you can basically think of these, these metabolic pathways, as you know, graph rewriting rules. And, and what you can do is you can say, well, you, and, and CAP is meant to simulate, do physical simulation of these systems and the amounts of metabolites and things like that for, um, you know, against these rules. You can simulate a genetic disease by just taking out the rule that corresponds to the missing gene. And say, well, now what happens? What metabolites are in excess and what metabolites disappear? Um, and we even simulated uh, treatments for, for certain enzyme deficiencies. Um, and, but I think you know, ultimately what you want to do here is not do simulations. You want to use static analysis on these, on these systems to predict unreachable species at this point. So it turns out other people are actually already doing this. So last year there was a paper uh, on, on this called CASA, which actually analyzes CAPA systems and can start to answer some of these questions. The, the limiting region here, then, is, is really not going to be just the, the static analysis, but it's actually on the biological side. It's actually having enough rules to faithfully describe the biology. So at some point, you know, we'll sort of fully understand the, you know, all the metabolic networks in, in the human body, and then we could use these very principled tools like, like Kaza to reason about uh, what we might do for a disorder like that. So how is Bertrand today? Well, he's doing pretty well. He's a, you know, all things considered for a serious disorder, a very happy kiddo. Uh, and, you know, based on this cocktail of drugs that he's now on, he is making some forward, in fact, I would say substantial developmental progress at this point. Uh, because starting around age nine, he finally qualified to use an eye gaze computer. So he could look at things on a screen and put together sentences to tell us what he wanted. And so one of the first things he very clearly asked for was a pet fish. Um, but more specifically, he asked for a whale shark. Um, just said it was a little beyond my budget. Um, but we did get him an aquarium with some nice fish. So uh, we can go beyond rare diseases. So I have a precision oncology program as well. We have, I have programs in precision mental health where we focus on precision therapeutics for things like depression. But in precision oncology, the game is really you know pull out the tumor, sequence the tumor DNA, identify the mutations driving the tumor, and use those to find optimal treatments, uh, which is something we do at the scale of hundreds of people per year in clinical trials now at UAB. Um, and just to give an example of what this can do when it really works, you know, we have a patient here who uh, had prostate cancer, symptomatically, and had you know, gone through 42 rounds of radiation and 17 rounds of chemo without really denting the disease. But when we looked at the mutations driving this particular prostate cancer, we realized that genetically speaking, it looked a lot more like what you see in ovarian cancer. So this prostate cancer patient went on an ovarian cancer drug that was genetically indicated, and we saw a complete remission. It's, cancer's just gone within three months, you know, after many years of suffering. Uh, and, and about a year and a half out, he is still entirely cancer-free, despite having metastases all over his body at that point. So if a patient goes treatment resistant, then we can brute force it. So I have a colleague at, at UAB, Chris Klug, and what he does is, uh, for leukemia right now, he pulls out uh, the tumor, which in this case is blood, uh, and then starts testing it against uh, different drugs to see if anything kills it. And he just does this for every approved drug, times uh, plus all the drugs that are in clinical trials. So this, this really is the brute force approach to, to treating cancer. And the amazing thing is he always finds something for any given patient. Um, so now I'll close with one last example that really pulls everything all together. Uh, and, and this uh, was actually happened back in May. So this is very pretty recent for me. And it started when uh, on Star Wars Day, so May 4th, I took Bertrand to the Star Wars Museum, uh, down to the aquarium in the base, uh, the science museum. I took him down to the aquarium in the basement. And uh, five hours later, he was almost dead from septic shock. I mean, so from healthy, happy, to almost dead in five hours. And this launched a second very rapid diagnostic odyssey. And so when he went to the ER, I asked Medicare in three questions. I said, okay, what causes septic shock? What are the consequences of septic shock? And what are the treatments for septic shock? And when I looked down that long tail into the unknown known, I saw something interesting that caught my eye, and that was albumin. And there are, again, two or three papers in support of albumin. But when you read them, it was very clear that uh, albumin levels were strongly correlated with survival in, in septic shock. Uh, and, and the other thing I knew is that all angle one patients have very low albumin by default. And so Bertrand's odds of dying at that point were about 
if you just look at the numbers. So uh, I said to the physicians, here's two papers. You need to read these immediately, and you need to give Bertrand albumin. And they did. They actually gave him albumin on the spot. And probably the reason he even survived that first night was that he actually got albumin um, uh, right away. So that ended up um, with uh, uh, our, our first week in the ICU. Now, unfortunately, all the cultures were negative. We knew it was an infection of some kind, but we couldn't figure out which one it was. So fortunately, he stabilized uh, by the end of week one. And then week two slowly improved to the point where, with supplemental oxygen, they actually said, OK, you can go home. He's just got a fever now. I'm sure he'll recover. But he was back in 24 hours with extreme pain um, in the ER. And that began week three in the ICU, because now he had a bone infection, swelling in the abdomen, and fluid outside the lung so strong it actually collapsed the lung. Uh, of course, the cultures were still negative. We, like, we just couldn't figure out what this thing actually was. Nothing was growing in a dish. Uh, so he had two surgeries to clean out the bone. And they said, well, there's so much fluid in his lungs that we have to like, literally put a, a hose in his chest and drain the fluid. So uh, this is him when he was supposed to go in for surgery. And then four hours later, he had a, a pulmonary crash. So his oxygenation dropped about 12%. Uh, and they rescued him on this high flow oxygen. But I'll tell you right now, at this point, you know, I did not think Bertrand was going to survive the night, and, and neither did, uh, did his mom. And so this is basically, you know, Christina, um, my wife, saying goodbye to Bertrand. And this, we thought this, these were his final moments of consciousness. Now, amazingly enough, he did survive the night, because I was begging them, please do the operation now so that he can actually breathe again. Um, but when they tried to operate, his, his, blood, his, his blood had a problem. His hematocrit had crashed in 90%. So to even get to an operation, he had to get a blood transfusion, which he did. And he survived, and he actually got a chest tube that started to very slowly drain the blood. Uh, or the fluid from around his lungs. Um, and then, in front of the entire team, he coded again in the ICU, had another pulmonary crash. They rescued him again. They realized his chest tube wasn't big enough to, to pull out all the, all the fluid, so he got a bigger one. This was, fortunately, big enough to pull it out faster than it was generating, uh, but still, the cultures were negative. And now, we're three weeks in, and it's Memorial Day weekend. And the resident says to me, nothing happens in hospitals on weekends, so we're just going to try to keep him alive until Tuesday. Uh, and I said, at this point, OK. Uh, Technically, I do precision medicine. At this point, I think I have to practice what I preach. I need to write some code. So I created a diagnostic medicanrum. I said, we have all this knowledge from the literature and these other databases. And we can check to see if a disease causes a symptom. And then we can start ranking um, you know, the, the diseases by their explanatory power for the number of symptoms that they explain. So if a disease explains all four symptoms, you say, OK, well, then it's up at the top. If it only explains one, it's down at the bottom. And so I, I generated this list. And these are the, the, the diseases that explained all the symptoms that we were seeing in Bertrand. So there weren't many. And it said, well, can we need to begin this process of ruling out which ones they are. Uh, these are. And so to, to rule them out as fast as possible, I engage in something called metagenomics. So your metagenome is not just your genome. It's the genomes of all the little bugs floating around you at the same time. So if you pull out really any fluid or tissue from somebody, uh, you'll find that not only are there bugs in it, but there's also their DNA in it. And so you can use it to figure out what is there. And the question was, can we find the bug that was, was killing Bertrand? So I literally checked his blood and his pleural fluid out of the hospital and drove it 90 minutes north um, in a relay uh, through my director of operations, Andy Krause, to uh, this uh, genomic scientist, Sean Levy, at a facility called Hudson Alpha in, in Huntsville, Alabama. There, we did 40x shotgun sequencing four times over in three days. For comparison, doing one exome, 2% of the genome took two years, seven years ago. And here we did the whole genome four times over in three days. So what was it? Well, if you look at the distribution of, of pathogens in Bertrand's tissues, you got a lot of stuff. Because we've all got a lot of stuff all the time. There's all sorts of DNA floating around in there. But we can start to say, well, if you intersect the metagenomics with what the, the predictions that came out of Medicanrin, there's actually only one thing left. And that's Pseudomonas, uh, which is you wouldn't typically get infected with this. But if you're immunocompromised, it could happen. Um, so the question was, can we prove that this is what it was to the physicians? So we did some uh, experiments to localize the pathogen in the specific tissues. And what we did was we actually burst all the cells in a sample. Um, and we did this because if you, if you sequence a sample, if the DNA for an organism isn't there, you're not going to see it. So in this sample, you can't see the green organism because it doesn't have any DNA there yet. So it looks like it's 50% red, 50% blue. But if you go back and pop all the cells, now everything is visible according to your DNA microscope, if you will. So uh, what we were looking for was a big shift in the amount of DNA present for any given organism before and after bursting these cells. So we did that. And in the pleural fluid alone, not in the blood, we did see that shift. And that shift was, in fact, for Pseudomonas. Uh, the other thing that was, was interesting about this was that there was also a lot of DNA for a phage, a virus that eats Pseudomonas. And so if something that eats Pseudomonas is there in large quantities, then the thing it eats has to be there too. Also saw a lot of DNA for E. coli, more, more than we, we would have expected. And so uh, we picked an unusual, a, a not, not typically used antibiotic, meropenem, that could, in theory, kill both of them. 
So after four weeks in the ICU, uh, within 48 hours, he was actually out onto a regular hospital floor. His pleural effusions, this, this fluid outside his lung was rapidly receding. Uh, his swollen abdomen went, went away within about a day. Um, and within five days, he was off of oxygen support. Uh, so we did one round of metagenomics at the end to show that Pseudomonas and E. coli were completely gone from his system. Uh, and this was him the day he found out he was going to get to go home. And this is him uh, being reunited with his fish. And the thing I told him during this whole process was that, you know, when you get out, when you get out of this hospital, I will take you down to the beach and we will go swimming with, with dolphins. And so a week later, I actually did that, took him down to swim with the dolphins in the Gulf Coast of Florida uh, to celebrate him getting out of the hospital. And meanwhile, while all that was happening, I actually got an NIH grant funded to do a clinical trial of a new drug for angli-1 deficiency. And so that trial will start for a number of patients in February. Uh, now, to close, there's, I'll say, if, if you're interested in moving into biomedicine from PL, I have some recommendations. This book um, is, is probably you know, the, the, the best way to jump right in because it will actually allow you to, um, in about two days, get up to speed on all the relevant bits of biology that you need. So it's called Quick Start Molecular Biology, and it really is geared towards mathematicians or physicists or computer scientists. Um, in the near term, I definitely need more help with NLP. Um, I, you know, Sort of done some work with parsing, but NLP is a different beast entirely. And I know we can do better NLP on the literature than we have done. Uh, so I, we definitely need that. Uh, and ultimately, I do think that this whole regime of providing proofs for patients back to physicians is absolutely essential. Um, if you don't give the physician that proof, uh, then they will not accept that advice and they will not give that treatment to the patient. It is a, an essential part of the process. So I think um, I didn't cover all the computational modalities that we use for, for doing repurposing today, but there's a lot. And all of these modalities must ultimately become proof-bearing modalities, where that every time they render a prediction, they also render a proof as well. So the take home today, I would say, is that ultimately, there really is no such thing as not actionable. That if in medicine or in life in general, you encounter a situation where you are told that there's nothing that you can do, uh, that phrase has absolutely outlived both its usefulness and its truthfulness. Because in the event that there's nothing you can do, it is always possible to do science. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Um, I see a couple people standing already, I think, for questions, right? Can you raise your hand if you have questions? And I think we have volunteers with mics. Yes, and, and please, no PL questions. <laughs> <laughs> should we should we kind of make a line here? Or you can just run? Great, thank you. Oh, so, OK, so you told us that you have a lot of work on uh, natural language processing, but why? What I think is that when these people create their papers, they should just put like the rules in there. But we, as a PL community, could do work to make some languages that medicine people understand to write down these rules, and I think that that's more valuable than NLP. And second, isn't it like? Shouldn't it be um, more work to also put like negative things uh, in your papers? And how would that work in your system to also like incorporate negative results? Like this does not inhibit this. Yeah, so to answer your first question, yes, absolutely. I think it would be ideal if the paper's authors actually are the ones that wrote down these encoded, um, you know, formalized summaries of, of what's in their paper. Uh, and you know, that might happen someday. Uh, and in fact, there's sort of a natural database where we could encode these right now. It's called Wikidata. So you could, you could deposit them in Wikidata and have them displayed up alongside the, the PubMed entry. I'd love a system like that. Uh, and, and secondly, yes. So P, I mean, in terms of like the languages and formats being designed and used in this field, they're awful. Um, PL people, I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's just as from, from a matter of taste alone, should be involved in the process of designing these meta languages and specifications so that we get it right and that they're reasonable and easy to parse and flexible. And, 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 and to answer you know, the, the point about negations as well, um, so yes, you, we, we do store negative results. Um, and, and the way that the sort of standard system for doing the NLP encodes this is it just puts an NEG underscore in front of the, the predicate. 
Uh, and so there's obviously much, you know, it's, it's literally baked into the lexical structure of this format, which is ridiculous. That's not the way it should be, but that's how they did it because they're not PL people. Um, and then, uh, okay, you know, not, not to really rag on, on Kappa, but the, the syntax for Kappa is pretty awful. Um, and so again, you, you can see where non-PL people have tried to do PL things inside of medicine, um, or literally any bioinformatics data format, period. Um, they're all awful, every single one of them. Um, and, and so you know, uh, one, one of the efforts I have right now is actually uh, my MD PhD student is, is just basically rewriting all of bioinformatics in Racket um, so that we'll at least have S expressions as a clean intermediate format for all that. So yeah, I agree on, on both accounts. Okay, uh, thank you, Matt. Mira Mezzini, TU Darmstadt, Germany. Um, great talk, and especially thank you for the last mes message in the last slide. My question is, um, how far are we from some practitioners using your system? So um, it seems like you use it, but who else can use it and make make great? Uh... Uh, that's a good question. So who else can use it? Well, we. Um, Every time I give a talk to a medical audience, people end up installing it, uh, and and so it's it, it is gaining adoption. We have a GUI for it, which is pretty easy to use for you know you know, a reasonably technically literate uh, user. Uh, physician frontline physicians will not be using the underlying programming language interface, but the GUI enables them to answer lots of the common questions they want to ask, like what's a treatment for this, what's an inhibitor for this, what's an activator for this. So they. Almost anybody could run those very easily. Now, in the in the interim, you know, I have this team of undergraduates that is trained in the tool, and so they act as the human interface to the tool on behalf of many physicians around the world at this point. Um, and I'm, I'm comfortable with that because every time that system gets used, we also capture the question they're trying to ask, and so we can tailor the kinds of queries that we can answer easily to the kinds of questions that people actually need to answer in practice, whether they're a physician scientist working on a scientific problem or they're actually trying to work on behalf of an individual patient. Uh, and in fact, there's some folks in the Room that have volunteered to build a web-based version of the tool, uh, which we can do as soon as we sort out some of the data licensing restrictions on, on some of the data sets. So not all the data sets are free for commercial use. They're all free for academic use, um, but not everything is free for commercial use. So we're going to create sort of a, a stripped-down version of the data set that has no IP infr infringement uh, issues and then put that on as a, as a web-based tool. I think that'll really open it up at that point um, so that really any, any physician around the world that wants to access all this knowledge can do that uh, and, 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 and dig, dig into it on behalf of a patient. And in your experience with their acceptance uh, willingness, um, I'm curious just uh, the physicians, how do they react when you come and tell you ought to give my son this medication because I think here's the proof. So yeah. what's the reaction? So in, in terms of adoptance, our adoptance rate is probably 80, 90 percent. Uh, so it's, I, I'm surprised it's that high. But and, and, and generally, the physicians are quite grateful for it too. Um, because these, these, almost always these are cases where they had no other option left. And suddenly we're coming up out of the blue and saying, have you considered this and here's why. And so I think if we did this without proofs uh, and, and didn't offer them any evidence as to why they should do it, the acceptance rate might be zero. Um, and, and that's because if you're a physician, you're not just thinking about the patient, you're also thinking about getting sued. I hate to make this the, sort of the, the practical reality of the situation, but you know, if you have a logical argument that says this is why I should do this, that's something you could hold up in court and say, look, I had a reason to do this, and it was a, a, a logical, valid reason to, to try this. Um, and, and so they like that, yeah, because it, 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 gives, it gives them covering fire grounded in the scientific literature. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as far as the decisions that don't take the recommendations, sometimes we do have to recommend toxic compounds or compounds that have you know, significant toxicities. And it's up to the physician and the family to really weigh whether or not they want to accept the side effects to correct the underlying disorder. I think we have time for just one more question. Yep, there's one here. Sorry. Sorry. So great talk. Thank you very much. Um, my mother is actually a molecular biologist and is also very interested in computational tools. Um, and I was wondering if you have any opinions on things like CRISPR and new g genetic editing tools and how um, innovations on the biology and medicine side affect the computational work that you're doing. Sure. Um, so yeah, we, I, you know, I didn't talk about it today, but we do a lot of wet biology too, and, and CRISPR is obviously a very useful tool. So if you're not familiar with CRISPR, just think of it as you know Emacs for your genome. Um, so you, you can go in and make point mutations across. In fact, just like two days ago, a brand new, super powerful CRISPR technology came out that sort of uh, revolutionizes what you can. You can do multi-base editing, I and mean, you can do all kinds of stuff now with with the newer CRISPRs. But yeah, basically, it's you edit the genome 
in a somewhat arbitrary way and very precisely. Um, so it's, it was immediately useful for me, the second it came out, to create model organisms. So we created flies and fish and worms and mice overnight for this disease at very low cost because we could just go in and edit the embryos and give them this disease. Previously, that would have cost an order of magnitude or more than it used to using older genetic engineering techniques. So right away, yeah, the, the ease of making models instantly went down with CRISPR. And now people are talking about using CRISPR therapeutically. And so Vertex is actually looking at doing a trial of a CRISPR therapy for hemophilia. Um, and and, and uh, we're probably going to see some CRISPR therapies for, for blindness because uh, the retina is very accessible. But uh, in general, you know, we're, we're not quite there in terms of, of uh, wanting to CRISPR your entire body. First of all, it's hard to deliver the CRISPR-Cas9 apparatus to the entire body, to every cell. That's, that's challenging. Secondly, if you did that with current technology, not only would you make the edits you're looking for, but you'd make a number of off-target edits as well. And if you multiply the error rate by the number of cells in the human body, what you get is cancer. Um, so you fix the disease and also end up with cancer in the process. Um, now, that the error rate is going down substantially over time. And at some point, it will get to the point where the error rate is acceptable for actually doing CRISPR um, in somatic cells. And then at the same time, we'll have reasonable mechanisms for actually delivering that apparatus to uh, either all the cells or at least the target cells that really matter within the body. So, you know, sometimes we do recommend CRISPR as a modality for patients, but almost never right now, because there's almost always something that's going to be easier or simpler to do than CRISPR. So. All right, great. Well, let's uh, thank Matt again. Just a couple of very quick announcements. One is that there are three elevators for the sixth floor and the seventh floor for lunch. So two on the right side uh, from the lobby and one at the very far left side.